If you've got your handout with you this morning, as I always try to do, I've put some uh, scriptures on paper in advance, thinking that might be where I'm headed today. You never really know, but uh, it's kind of fun. I put a, a picture together today of a, um, a, a, a centenarian, um, Fuja, I think it's Singh, Singhi. Uh, he's from Punjab in uh, India. And he started marathon running, you know, that's 26.2 miles, at age 89. <laughs> I just, a remarkable kind of thing. And uh, between 89 and 100, he did an annual thing. And I think he, he finally retired at 108 or something like that. Now, there's, a, there's at least a two-year question mark on his age because he was born so long ago in India, they didn't have birth certificates. <laughs> so, he, you know, he, there's, there may be a two-year gap in there, but, you know, he's just a late bloomer, you know, starting at 89 like that. But uh, I, I'm thinking about him a little bit today because we're going to talk about Caleb today at an older stage in his life, at not quite this old, but in his 80s. And I want to spend some time today thinking with you about having a Caleb spirit, having a Caleb heart. And it's not just because one of our greatest guys around here is Caleb, even though it's been fun to watch him grow up and, and uh, be a part of ministry and things here. Um, but I do want to think about the Caleb from the book of Joshua, which is where we've been spending a chunk of our time uh, together. And let's just bring out a couple four characteristics of Caleb's life that could be encouragements for us, that could be kind of a character study kind of model for us. I love character studies because you see in flesh, you see lived out in someone's life, the characteristics that could become helpful or exemplary for you and I to put into our lives and to be helpful. And Caleb is one of those characters, one of those individuals that um, God uses in an amazing way. So jot these notes down, if you would, and we'll think through together. First of all, Caleb had a wholehearted spirit, a wholehearted spirit. What's that opposed to? A half-hearted spirit. <laughs> you know about the half-hearted spirit. You know, what did Jesus say? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. You know, there's this wholehearted aspect where sometimes we settle for a portion. Yeah, I love God. And we kind of stack him up along other things that we care about and love. And yet, it's to be an entirety of our heart. It's to be the complete all right, so there's several things. There's six times in Scripture that Caleb is actually um, referred to as wholeheartedly uh, think, devoted to the Lord. And notice what it says here. It says, Caleb has a different spirit. A different spirit. Some of us would say a different heart. Okay? It's interesting. Now, different from who? Well, different from his peers, even different from Joshua. He is different from the other 10 spies who went out with him. Different from the other nation that ended up dying in the wilderness. He had a different spirit. Is that something you and I could identify with? Could it be that God's calling us to have a different spirit, especially in a culture that has challenges right now, even revering or loving God at all? He wants us to have a different spirit. And it says, because he follows me wholeheartedly. Because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land. Um, literally, that means, the, the word wholehearted here, another way of translating it was, with, it was filled with pursuing. Filled with pursuing. Now, Back in the day when Caleb was born, they typically did not name their babies until they were one, two, or three years old. 
Now, part of that was the infant mortality rate was really, really high. But most of it was they wanted the name to reflect the character. And I don't know, there's no proof of this, but probably they saw something, Caleb's parents saw something in Caleb's life that said, this guy's one determined dude. Okay? This guy's got, in fact, he's got dogged determination. In fact, that's what the, the word Caleb means. <laughs> dogged determination or dog. So if you see Caleb around, call him a dog. You know, <laughs> he's a dog lover. But, but think about that for a minute. So you think about a dog, uh, maybe a pit bull, clamping onto something and saying, I- I'm not going to let go. I'm not going to let go. That's the personality characteristic of Caleb. He was determined. And you see that in his life. You see it lived out. And you see the blessing of being determined, especially when you grab onto God. When you grab on to the Lord and you're determined to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. He followed God fully. Oh, that we would end our lives with that kind of an epitaph on our lives. Following the Lord completely. Never left anything out. Didn't fudge on the details. Didn't go, what's the least I can do to get by and go to heaven? That's what I see our people doing. I see so often, what's the least I can do to get by? No, 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 no. Wholehearted is the only way to go because then you have got all of God's rewards. You've got all of the, 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 the blessings that come with being fully determined, fully following and pursuing the Father. So I've listed some things that kind of come out of this. First of all, Caleb saw himself this way. So I say, Caleb reports it. When he's just talking about himself, he says, yeah, this is me. And I put down uh, Joshua 14 there. But my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. Those stupid idiots. You know, we, we saw the same thing, and they caused fear instead of faith. But I, however, followed the Lord my God whole. Heartedly. So he's explaining how he could be in a 2 to 10 minority. He gave the minority report, God can do it. How do he do that? How do he stand up against his peers in a 10 to 2 ratio? One way, <laughs> wholehearted trust in God, wholehearted belief. He saw himself in that role. How do you see yourself? How do you see yourself? What is your self-identification when it comes to you and your relationship with God? I want to encourage you in some ways. Don't just say, yeah, God and I are okay. We, we made peace. There's nothing wrong with that. But what if you, like Caleb, clamped onto God and said, God and I, I ain't letting go, no matter what. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my leader. The Lord is my guide. And I see myself in a wholehearted category. It starts with yourself. If you don't take on a wholehearted attitude, it is not going to happen. There's too many forces against that. But if you say, as for me and my house, we will, we're going to serve the Lord. If you say that with dogged determination, you're going to be far more likely to succeed in it And if you just, wind and waves, the the book of James says, tossed to and fro by the wind and the waves. You know, you'll never be anchored like Caleb was anchored. He says, I I, I serve in the Lord wholeheartedly. Now, I I notice also that other people around him, when they gave his pedigree, when they described Caleb to others, they said, uh, Hebron belongs to the Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, ever since, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel. They say it again. It's one of the six times. Wholeheartedly. The reason things happened in the way they did, and we're going to look at this in more detail, but the reason they happened the way they did because, it was because of Caleb's dogged determination to follow God wholeheartedly. Now, this is my favorite. God rewarded it. God rewarded it. You know, in Jesus' book, he said, I only do what the Father calls me to do. You know? 
And ultimately, that's where Caleb was at. He just wanted to do what God was calling him to do. And if that meant it went against all of his peers, so be it. So be it, because God loves to reward. God loves to reward those whose hearts are fully his. You guys know this verse, right? It's listed on your paper here, I think. It says, um, For the eyes of the Lord range to and fro throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Second Chronicles 16.9. Think about it for a minute. The eyes of the Lord are ranging across the face of the earth. And what's he looking for? He's looking for hearts. He's looking for wholehearted commitment. He's looking for hearts whose hearts are fully devoted to him. And what's he want to do? What's he want to do? It says strongly support. He wants to reward everyone whose heart is fully devoted to him. Just think about it for a minute. There's nothing between you and all of God's rewards except your desire to be sold out for him. Sold out for him. Holy devoted. We're not looking for perfection. That's not what God's eyes are looking for. I got to find a perfect person. He would never find one, would he? What's he looking for? A heart that's devoted to him. A heart that is totally devoted to him. So, um, yeah. I also, um, let me put this down. I'll remember it. Shot that one down. So God rewards it and all the people around him. So at the end of Caleb's life, as they're looking back on his life, no one except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh of Kenzanite, and Joshua, son of Nun, followed the Lord wholeheartedly. That's, that is that uh, epitaph. The notable characteristic isn't to be half-hearted, it's to be wholehearted. What about it, team? Are we going to be sold out for the Lord? Don't settle for a God experience. Don't settle for a, a, a $10 of God. Get the whole package or forget it. You know? Embrace the Lord completely. Give your heart totally to Him. Another thing about Caleb I want to mention today is he was an encourager. He had an encouraging spirit. Jot that down because, uh, first of all, he comes along when there's fear in the camp, when there's fear in the midst, and he does something really amazing. He quiets the people. Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are able to. To do it. So, as this quieting the fear comes along, let me encourage you that encouragement always quiets fears. Encouragement always quiets fear, fears. We live in a day, we live in an age when fear is promulgated, fear is fostered. Our, our, our social networks and our advertisements. And, and just our, so, our, our media in general, tend to make more money when people are fearful. And so anytime that it, it, they have an option, they tend to promote the fear. What do encouragers do? What did Caleb and Joshua do? Caleb quieted the people. Can I just ask you a personal question? Are you a people quieter? When, people, when, when you walk in the room, when you start the discussion, when you're in the home group, do you have to share the latest news and kind of get people riled up and upset? Or do you quiet the people with God's strength, with God's ability, with what God's about? That's what he did. Everybody was upset. Oh, no, there's giants in the land. Oh, no, we can't do it. He quieted the people. Now, notice it wasn't Moses who quieted the people. And it wasn't Joshua who quieted the people. Two natural leaders 
Moses and Joshua. They're the formal leaders. They led the entire tribe. But they weren't the encouragers. Who was the encourager? The side study of Joshua. The the one who was beside Joshua all the way. Caleb. Caleb comes along and he goes, shh, guys, 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 guys. Don't let fear melt, grip, and sustain your heart. God is bigger than all of it. Don't be afraid. Jesus was like that. Every, every time he turned around, he said, do not fear. Don't be afraid. He calmed their fears, and he encouraged because he quieted them. In Numbers 32, it says, why do you, meaning the other ten, discourage the people of Israel from crossing over into the land that God has given them? The only two people at that point that we're encouraging is Joshua and Caleb. Two encouragers and ten discouragers. <laughs> Can I offer to you that that's probably the, 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 the rate, that's probably the ratio of encouragers and discouragers in the world today, in our community today, maybe even in our church today? God wants to flip that. He wants to totally reverse that. Okay? And you may say, well, the encouragement is not my gift. <laughs> we'll make it your gift. Because the Bible says, encouraging one another all the more as you see the day of the Lord drawing near. <laughs> Stimulate one another to love and to good deeds. Why? Stimulate and encourage, he says. It's not, well, let the encouragers do the encouraging. I'm a discourager. What? No, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ... If you're a follower of God like Caleb was, then you could come along and say, don't be discouraging to the people. Instead, be encouraging. It's not just a gift for a few. I think it's a call to the many. The reason they spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness was specifically because they were discouragers and they took over. Maybe need to say something today about uh, the majority rules. When the majority rules, we're in trouble, okay? When God rules, <laughs> we have victory. Yeah, yeah. So quiet the people. Quiet your husband and wife. Quiet your kids. Quiet your brothers and sisters. Encourage them. You, you know the root meaning? Place courage in. Encourage means to place courage in someone. You have that kind of power. You have that kind of strength when you place courage in someone. Don't let it be courage about you or even about them. You can do it. No, God can do it. That's the point. Well, it's taking that phrase a little little bit further from uh, Numbers 13. I, I say it this way. Encouragement is inclusive. And I just love this about encouragement. It's not a command. It's not in the imperative mode, go do this. You know what it is? They call it the hortatory subjunctive. And all that means is they use the word let's. Let's do this. What's he say there? Let us. (laughs) Shorten it, we'd say let's. Let's go up at once and take possession. You know, something different happens when we say, hey, go do that, and we tell someone in the imperative mode just to go take care of that. Something else happens when you say, come on, come on, let's do it together, come on. That's the, that's the inclusive version of encouraging one another. Don't tell people what, don't tell your kids what to do. We live in a society that right now today, We've got leaders telling people to do certain things and then them doing the opposite, right? It's so discouraging because they're not in the mode of saying, let's, they're in the mode of saying, you, go do. I'm going to do something else. Do as I say and not as I do doesn't work, okay? Caleb was the opposite. He was like, come on, let's go. Oh, that we would be that kind of people with that kind of encouragement. Let's do it together. 
Let's be on God's team together. Whatever you command or encourage others in, make it be a inclusive let's. Let me grab this one real quick because there's almost always an all encouragement action. Action. Don't just encourage to a heart or a, a thought. Encourage to how that thought or, or, or heart takes root and takes action and gets expressed. The Bible says, uh, for we are well able to what? Overcome it. Overcome them. You know, when you put courage inside someone, make it courage toward an action. Courage toward an action. Focus on what uh, will, will, will come out of it. The practical um, practice of, of, of giving them an action to do. Now, uh, Caleb is famous for a couple of phrases. One of them is so action-oriented. I just want to think about it at this point. We'll read about it in more detail here in a minute. But he comes across his inheritance, and he says, Give me this mountain. I might be an old guy, and it may be a big challenge, but give me this hill. Give me this hill country. Give me this mountain. Uh, Joshua 14 says that. Now give me this mountain. Uh, what if we just repeat that for a minute as a masked group here today? Give me this mountain. You hear the action in that? Lord, give it to me. I want all the blessings you've got for me. I don't want to miss any of your inheritance for me. Give me this mountain. Let's repeat that again. Give me this mountain. Let me ask you a personal question. What's your mountain? What's your vision? What's, what's God calling on you to take possession of? What areas in your life is he prompting you to grow in? And to, where you can say, just like he does here, yes, give it to me, Lord. I want it all. I don't want to settle for anything less than all you've got. I don't want to go through life with a portion of your blessing. I want it all. Yeah. Encouragement is active. Give me this hill country. Give me this mountain. I'm thinking about the video we saw at the teen program Wednesday night. And it was a video of the roof being torn apart and the friend being let down to Jesus. You know, there was so much action in their faith. But Jesus comments about their faith. He says, your faith is beautiful. He says, your faith, your faith is making him whole. You know, faith needs action, right? Isn't that the secret of the book of James? You can show me your faith without actions. Go ahead and try. I'm going to show you my faith by my actions. Faith is, by its nature, functional and active and, 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 and optionally going somewhere. You know? The healing of a man with a broken body because of faith. Make sure your encouragement comes from an active place. A couple more here. This one is uh, my favorite word, vision. Caleb had a visionary spirit, okay? He, he could see it. He could envision it in his heart and his mind, and he knew what God was preparing to do. So this is a little bit longer section here, but let's read it um, at this point. This is from Joshua 14. Now the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and the Kizanite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. That's about Caleb and, and Joshua. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, here's that word again, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. 
So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that, your ch- and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord, the, 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 your God, or my God, heart, wholeheartedly. Now then, now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years. Everybody else had died off during that season. Since that time, he has said this uh, to Moses while Israel's moving about in the wilderness. So here I am today, how old? 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. Wow. I think he's ready to train for a marathon here, huh? I am just as vigorous to go out in battle now as I was then. Whoa. I'm not thinking he's bragging, but he's sure encouraged about how God protected him, isn't he? Now, give me this hill country. Give me this mountain that the Lord has promised me that day. You yourselves heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. (laughs) Is that incredible? Read a little bit further. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and said, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kezanite, ever since, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. Hebron used to be called Kiriath Arba after Arba, who was the greatest man among the Anakites. Then the land was free from war. Can you catch Caleb's amazing vision here? He was a visionary man, and his vision didn't fade even through 45 years of wilderness wandering. Now, I want to say to some of you who are between 45 and 85, okay? It's hard not to let that vision fade. Is it amazing how that vision was just as strong at 85 as it had been at 40? No? Let me think about it with you. In fact, I put it this way. Vision is not age-related. We should be casting vision in our teens and our young people. We should be handing them big doses of what do you want to do with your life? How do you want God to use your life? What do you have in store for the kingdom of God coming through you and your ministry? We should be placing big doses of vision in our kids. But vision is not age-related. Every person anywhere along the spectrum of life should have a huge dose of what's God calling you to do. How's God wanting to use your life? What is it that God's calling your ministry to encompass and to be like? Don't, Paul says it, aged along in his life. He says, I'm an old guy, but I have not attained. I press on. I don't stop. I press on to the good things God has in store for me yet. Now, he'd been stoned and left for dead. He'd been in prison four times. He'd been bitten by a poisonous viper and they expected him to... I mean, just go through the list and you go, what's Paul got to live for? Amazing vision in a 70-year-old man, the Apostle Paul. Amazing vision in an 85-year-old man, Caleb. Wow, what could God do if he could keep a a vision active in every one of our lives where we had a vision, a, a Caleb spirit vision, where we said, I want the hill country. Give me something to grasp on. Give me something tough to do. <laughs> you know? I say this contrasts so much with our culture. The, what's the least I have to do to get by? I mean, what do I have to do to go to heaven? I, I don't really want to be used by God too much. I, I, I just kind of want to coast. I, I hear that in people's hearts. And I'm like, what? Are you serious? You want to coast through this life God's given us? You're missing out on the best opportunity, the best things that he has for you. Never retire from trusting and serving the Lord. Never. If you're going to retire from your occupation, 
If you're going to retire from your vocation, no worries. You got more time. You know you got more time for the kingdom of God. The things that in, in the past you were like, I got to put in these hours. I can't focus where I want. Oh, God's got a plan. God's got a heart. God's got a goal for you. Your retirement years could be the most involved and successful in the kingdom ever. Yeah. Maybe he wants you to sit on a beach with your feet propped up, <laughs> sipping a cold drink. Maybe. I'm not against those things. I love those things too, periodically. But oh, to waste your best golden years of your life when you've got wisdom, you've got uh, advice, you've got encouragement for people that need it, need it desperately. Could be within your family, could be outside your family, could be within the body of Christ. Amazing need out there. You are never too old to have more victories. You are never too old to, to, to lose the vision for God using you in the battle. He wants you to make a difference at every age and at every stage. It's a different difference. It's a different difference, but he still wants you at every turn to make a difference. I, I could go on. Well, let me just go to this one. The vision itself brings about strength. If you feel weak, you need to tune up your vision, not just your muscles. If you feel dis disheartened, it's about vision. Cast and catch God's vision. Now, here's the amazing thing about Caleb. He's wandering with his buddies because of no fault of his own. He was wholeheartedly devoted to Christ, to, to, to God. But because of his culture, he's wandering for 40 years. 40 years years. In the back of his mind is this vision of this mountain, of this mountain region that's so gorgeous. It's the mountain region where they went in and they got a, a, a cluster of grapes so large that it took two men and a pole to even carry one cluster of grapes. I mean, that's the amazing fruit. And he says, and that's not even to count the palm granites. That's not even counting the Avocados and all the other great things that are here, okay? So the vision is embedded deeply in Caleb's mind, and he is not letting go of it. He's got that dogged determination. He's remembering and reflecting and thinking about not just the physical vision. He says, I want God to own that, that, that city. I want God to own that place. You know, the... Um, place was called uh, Kiriath Arba. It was named after the, the giants that were there, the Anakites, the Anakim, the Nephilim. There, there were this, this, maybe we would call them a freaks of nature that were in there. You've heard of um, Goliath, the nine, ten foot tall uh, giant who came after in battle, uh, David. You know, This was in that same kind of group. These individuals who were in the ten foot tall category and amazingly powerful. We, we put them in the, in the circus these days, you know, as a, a freak of nature kind of thing. Well, it was filled. Hebron was filled with these giants, and it caused fear to come in Israel because of their power, because of their sheer might, because of what they had. So in the process and in the vision he ends up calling it a place Hebron. Hebron. Hebron means um, fellowship. Hebron means communion. Hebron means uh, closeness to God. Okay? He wanted to rename the giant dwellers, <laughs> and he wanted to name it close to God. I mean, if that's all the vision he had at 85, I'd say that's pretty amazing. <laughs> And it wasn't all that he had, but just think about it for a minute. He wanted to revolutionize a giant dwelling place to a God-loving place. Well, shouldn't that be our vision as well? Change the climate, the culture, the people, the, the landscape from being a giant, fearful place to being a God-loving place, to being a God-dwelling place. 
Hebron, fellowship with God. And see, it led him to strength. He says, I may be old, but I'm not weak. I may be old, but I'm not dead yet. He says, I, I've got as much ability and power that, that, that I did when I was a young man. I think his vision created strength in him. You probably know the statistics about when people retire and they do go and just sit on the beach with a nice cold drink. The death rate change between those and those who don't. It's like, what's going on there? Some of it is vision. Vision leads to strength. In, 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 in Caleb's life, it also sees the potential. Jot that one down. You know, Caleb got involved in some battles. One of them was a five-year battle. You think about it, hand-to-hand -hand combat for a five-year period of time. That's got to be brutal. What did, how did he make it through that? His strength was because of vision. The potential was there because of vision. He said, I'm not satisfied until I see all that God has promised for me. One of my favorite verses in Galatians, it says, don't grow weary in doing well. Don't grow weary in doing well, for you will reap if you do not give up. In due season, you will reap if you don't give up. It's that hang in there. Keep the vision. The strength relies to a large degree on that. Uh, Judges 1.9, I don't have it listed there, but it talks about Caleb's success at turning this mountain, turning this mountain of Kiriath Arba into a place of Hebron. In fact, here, let me just list some of these things. Hebron is 19 miles southwest of Jerusalem. It's pretty close. And it was the capital for the entire Israelite nation for years until David moved it to Jerusalem. David, with God's help. It became a city of refuge. You know what the city of refuge was? It was a place where convicted felons who weren't inv invited anywhere else, where immigrants who were on the run needed to go. It was a place where lepers and people who had diseases who couldn't go anywhere else. Hebron became a place of refuge, a place where people could go. It's kind of like if everybody's saying, not in my backyard, they're saying, yeah, come to our backyard. Camp out in our backyard. You are welcome here. Hebron became that place, not only of fellowship with God, but of care for people. I don't know all that uh, Caleb might have had in his mind when he pictured this, but that vision is getting carried out. That vision is amazing. Uh, the first seven years of David's um, ministry was in Hebron. Hebron. It's the highest place in Palestine. 3,000 square, uh, 3,000 foot level um, there. So this was, give me this mountain. I want to move mountains because God's called me to be a mountain mover. So let me just uh, pause for a minute to ask you, what do you see? What do you see? Number one, what's your vision for your ministry? What do you see God doing yet through your life? Where's he the most active and where's he the most motivating for you? Maybe he wants you to pour gas on that fire. Maybe he wants you to inflame that. He says, stir up the gift of God within you. Okay? Maybe he's wanting you and I to do that. What are your teammates? What are those the, uh, um, uh, around you with whom you're sharing vision? Are you casting vision for your family? Are you casting vision for your spouse and your, your loved ones? How is the vision casting going? Number three, how is it with you and the Lord, your God, your Savior? Do you have a vision of what Jesus Christ has done in your life? Is he your Lord? Is he the Savior, the master of your life? Has he covered over your sins? Nothing like a vision of God's amazing grace to lead the way as we go forward. One last thing. 
Caleb is an amazingly generous individual. Caleb gives himself and his possessions away. I'm taking this from the next chapter, verse, chapter 15, verse 13. In accordance with the Lord's command to him, Joshua gave Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, a portion of Judah in Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, verse 14. From Hebron, Caleb drove out the three Anakites, Sheshai, Ahiman, and Talmai, the sons of Anak. Caleb gave Othelon, his daughter, Ash, Aksha, Aksa, in marriage. One day she came to Othello and he urged her to ask her father, Caleb, for a field. When she got off the donkey, Caleb asked her, what can I do for you? She replied, do me a special favor. Since you have given me land in the Negev, give me also springs of water. So Caleb gave her the upper and lower springs. I'm just looking at a teeny little window here of a generous man. He didn't just have a vision for what God was going to do through him. He was passing it on. In this case, he gave his, uh, his daughter in marriage to someone, but then he gave away resources. He gave away land. He gave away stuff. I call it uh, generosity is stewardship. He'd been given much, so much is required. We've been given much, much is required. Jesus said this way, freely, freely you have received, freely give. Yeah, we give because we have received. Now, I, I look at his life and I, I see him giving more than he's asked. She asks him for something and he gives her double. I think that's remarkable. More generous than even was asked. But I love the fact that he asks her, what can I do for you? Could that be a phrase that we use around here? What can I do to help you? How can I be of service to you? What can I do for you? If we were that passionate, that giving, that generous with our time and our effort, think of the difference God could make, God would make in a group that does that. Instead of, well, I'm about my business and I've got my own details and I, I'm living my life and don't bug me and I hope nobody says hi too much or ask me anything. Wait a minute. What if we do the Caleb heart and just go, what can I do to help? I'm here. How can I love you more? How can I be of help to you? And watch God do some amazing things. Generosity is contagious. Generosity is contagious. You know, some people say you can't outgive God. <laughs> no. Second Corinthians chapter nine verse eight. Basically, that's the that's the encouragement. You cannot outgive God. Go ahead, try. I dare you. You know, He will so open the windows of heaven that you won't be able to contain it. And that's the testimony of Caleb. That's the testimony of this man. He's a generous heart. He has a generous spirit. He's giving and giving and giving, and God just keeps giving back. At age 85, he's still wanting to be used by God. The last thing is generosity is God's way. Why? Because God is the generosity leader. What's 1 John 4, 19 say? We love because he first loved us. That's where it all starts and stems from. So do you have a Caleb spirit? Number one, are you willing to stand alone? Are you willing to have a dogged determination to love God with all your whole Heartedly. Number three, are you willing to persist in your faith over time? Not to let your faith wane, but just the opposite. 
to let your faith grow. That's a Caleb heart, a Caleb spirit. And number three, are you willing to see all of life through spiritual eyes, a vision? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. We always tell you, thank you for loving us. Thank you for showing us through this great man, Caleb, a life of dedication and wholehearted love for you. Lord, would you cause the body of Christ here, each one of us as individuals and all of us as a group, to have that same wholehearted passion for you. Not running a marathon at an older age, but following your plan at every age. We desire, Heavenly Father, nothing more than to be different in our spirits than those around us. We desire to be Christ-like in every way. Would you grow us to that, Heavenly Father? For we pray this in Jesus' name.